So in principle, this stuff comes in, it's perfectly mixed, right? It's a standard assumption for stirred tank. Uh, there's an overflow line, so when you see this, this implies constant volume, right? Because you don't get any flow out of the system until the low region at this point, so it should be continuous in terms of constant volume. And then out here, you're going to have some mass fraction of A and some total flow, okay? And so the idea here is that, well, I'll explain in a minute. We might want to do something like this for control. I'm going to talk about this later, by the way. All these lectures will be posted. I don't have a TA yet for the course, so once once I get one and he can do the website, then I'll have everything posted. So if you're having trouble keeping up, don't worry. And they're recorded, as we'll soon discuss. All right? All right, so here might be the objective for control. Okay. So when you see this a process like this, um, at this point in time, I'm, I will tell you what the control problem of interest to me is. Obviously, if you're in interest, you'd have to, I mean, if you're in industry, you'd have to figure out how to control this yourself or at least someone telling you what to do, right? So at this point, I'm going to tell you the idea here is to adjust the flow rate of that pure A stream, that's called W2, okay? I want the outlet mass fraction equal some desired value. So when you see SP, that means set point, that means desired value. So which value I have to choose, what I want the outlet composition to be. <coughs> And I want this to be equal to the desired value despite the fact that composition coming in the other stream might vary, right? So the idea here, obviously, is if, let's say, for example, um, this mass fraction drops in the feed. Okay, X1 drops, then this is going to get all mixed up, and eventually X1 is going to drop, or X here is going to drop, right? And then I'm going to respond by adding more puree to bring X back up. Sounds pretty simple and principle, right? Um, the challenge here, I mean, one of the challenges is that this system has dynamics, right? So you know what a residence time of a process is, right? So it would be something like, um, so if this is a mass flow, it would be the volume of this reactor divided by the mass flows, like the residence time of the system. So in other words, when the inlet composition changes, you see that reflected in the outlet composition slowly, because it's, it's mixed, right? So that's something you have to keep in mind. So anyway, this is, so here's some um, notation. So the thing that we actually want to control to a set point is what we call the controlled output. The thing that we want to achieve, the value of the controlled output is called the set point. The thing that we're going to adjust in order to achieve the control objective is called the manipulated input. In this case, it's the flow of that period stream. And then something that's changing that we have no control over is called a disturbance input. So it's like the composition of the other stream. Right? Alright, so let's say... Um, we didn't care about process dynamics. We're just going to write out steady state equations. And um, I'm hopeful that you could all write these equations. So this is consistent with what we did in 361. If I put a bar over something, it means steady state. Okay? It saves the trouble of um, writing everything as a function of time forever. Right? So, so this is this this is an overall steady state mass balance, and this is an overall steady state uh, component balance. Everyone. Flow coming out equals the sum of the two flows in, and the amount of A coming out is the sum of the A coming in the two streams. Okay. All right. So let's say I aspire to accomplish this objective with these two equations. So the first thing, so what I'm going to do is combine these two equations. Okay. I'm going to specify x2 is equal to one, right? Because I already told you that's pure A in the second stream, so that's one. And then I'm going to set x bar here to be the set point. Because that's what I want. And so then I'm going to take this equation, um, eliminate, looks like that, eliminate, oh, eliminate W here, and then rework the equation to get something that looks like this. It's just algebraic manipulation, see when I did these two substitutions for my <coughs> equations. All right, so this, this equation seems to kind of do the job, right? It says if, um, if uh, x1 changes, okay, that's this value here, then I can consider changing x W2. So, so this is what we call a design equation, right? So this, tell, this tells me that if x1 is this value and I want it to be this, sorry, backwards. x1 is this particular steady state value and this is the value I want x to be, then this is the flow rate that will accomplish it, right? So if x1 is actually that value and if w1 is actually that value, then that w2 will make x equal. 
Okay, so the problem with that, first of all, x1 typically won't be constant, right? Because I told you it's, it might vary, so I don't know typically at this point what it is. And also, this doesn't account for the dynamics of the process. So this is a steady state approximation, and hopefully you can appreciate there's some dynamics of the process, and the dynamics have to do with the residence time, right? The characteristic time of the system is the residence time. If the residence time is long, large, then the dynamics are really slow which is typical of chemical processing. So the typical thing with a chemical process is that they're very slow, and that has big implications for control. The good news is you have a lot of time to figure out what to do, and the bad news is if you do it wrong, it takes a long time to recover. Okay. This would be contrasted with electrical engineering or robotics, right, when you're talking maybe about milliseconds of a robotic arm or something. So good news, a lot of time to make your decision, which means you can do kind of complex control calculations if you'd like. Bad news, um, if you do it wrong, it'll take a long time to recover. If you guys are in lab this year, right? You started in lab, you had 401. One of the experiments you'll do is the distillation column. And the first thing you'll appreciate about the distillation column is how slow it is. Like it takes like an hour to get to steady state. Okay? In fact, uh, people in the uh, lab have to set up the experiment before you get there just so you have a chance of getting some data during the four hour lab here. So things are very slow, typical of chemical processes. So it, it's, not, it's not a good idea to ignore dynamics. Okay? And that's the central theme of the course. Um, so what could we do about this? Well, this, this seems a sensible strategy. At least it does to me. Um, so what are we going to do here? So we, maybe we should implement something that looks like this. It looks just like the previous equation, except now I'm putting in here something that depends on time. So in other words, if x1 varies and I want to compensate, maybe I should measure it. Right? Try to measure the composition of the stream coming in here and compensate for it that way. So that's what this picture, you'll see a lot of pictures like this in the course. So what does this depict? This right here depicts I'm measuring something. This happens to be a composition measurement. So I'm going to measure the composition of this stream. Okay. Who can tell me how you would measure the composition of a liquid stream? Yes. Yeah, but more common probably at a GC. So you, you get, it's, um, composition measurements are actually, as we'll talk about through the course, they're expensive and they're difficult. You know, flow, temperature, pressure, those are the easy measurements. You start talking about composition or product, you know, pro, uh, pro, uh, properties of polymer, those are a lot more difficult. Okay? All right, so you send this signal, could be, like we said, FPIR or you know, some spectroscopic method or GC. You send this to a controller. What is this controller? This is the thing we're going to be focusing on in the course. We have to decide what this thing is. My argument here is that thing in that box, that's not a box, that thing in that circle is that equation right there. Okay? It takes this measurement from the um, GC, let's say, and then also you have to put in the set point, that's the desired value of the composition coming out, and it does this calculation, and then it's going to change this flow rate accordingly. This makes sense, right? Measure it, change the flow. Okay, okay so this. You know, if they say this is all there's to it, I wouldn't have a job. So it's not quite this simple. Um, the problem here, again, you haven't accounted for dynamics at all here. So it's, the way this equation looks, it looks like if you change this flow, it's going to affect the output composition immediately, and that's certainly not the case. Okay? The other problem here is, what about other disturbances, right? So what if it's not the composition changing, but the flow? Then you're like, well, let's measure the flow, too. Okay? But in a real plant, you know, there's thousands of things that you would need to measure to implement this strategy. You can't measure every flow, every temperature, every pressure. Um, so, when you guys go to the lab, you'll see, if, you know, have you guys seen valves? Full valve? I don't know if you've seen it, but even, even a small little valve for a lab costs $1,000. A valve in a plant could cost $10,000. I've seen valves on pipelines cost like $100,000. So, I mean, this instrumentation is expensive, and they don't put it in plants for fun. They put it in if it's necessary. So, a strategy where you say measure all possible disturbances could ever occur is not economically feasible. Okay, so this, this is not a bad idea um, in principle, but it's not going to solve all our problems. This is something called feed-forward control. It's called feed-forward control because we identify the source of the disturbance, which in this case is W1, and then we feed forward a measurement this thing to our controller. Okay. So this is measure the 
disturbance directly and try to compensate. Okay? The more common way to do it is probably the least obvious, at least you guys. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, why would you have the set point change with time if you did one? one well, you might decide you want the composition to change. I should have mentioned that. So oh. you might decide you'd like a different outlet composition yourself. Okay? Oh, okay. So you might change W2 for two reasons. One is because the disturbance changes and you have no control over that. Or you might have decided yourself you'd like the outlet composition to be a different value and you change it. Okay. Yeah. So in general, this desired value can be time dependent as well. It's something you would specify. So when I say um, operators monitor the plant, what they do is basically choose these set points. They choose what they would like to what the control engineer does this. All right, so here's maybe the less obvious strategy. So instead of measuring the disturbance that's causing the problem, I'm going to measure um, the thing I want to control. Okay. So I'm not measuring the disturbance, I'm measuring the composition of the outlet stream. That's the thing I want to have equal to set point. Okay. I'm going to measure this, I'm going to send this to some controller, <coughs> which I have to tell you what that is. And then based on a calculation of this controller, I'm going to adjust this valve. So here is the, the most common controller, well not, the most common controller is the on-off controller. You know, this is like your thermostat, right? It gets, let's say you're running your AC, if it gets a little, you know, if it gets uh, half a degree or a degree above the temperature you specified the set point, then it turns the air conditioning on until it gets like half a degree or a degree lower, and then it turns off and cycles off and on forever. Okay? This is not a good strategy for a valve, because valves are worn out by movement. So you're not going to have a strategy where you, you know, turn this valve completely on for a while and then completely off for a while. You could appreciate, I hope, that um, if you did that, the composition coming out that you want to be this is liable to look like, you know, this. If you just had it. So that's not a very good strategy to control the composition. So <coughs> what we're going to do is implement a, an algorithm that looks something like this. You'll see this again. It's called a proportional controller. And the idea here is the amount that we're going to change the flow rate of this pure A stream is proportional to the difference between <coughs> what you want the composition to be and what it is. Okay, this thing here is usually called the air. Okay, difference between the set point and the controlled output. So that zero, we're right where we want to be. Okay? And you'll see there's this so-called bias value here. So in other words, W2 bar is the value you specify if this error is zero. Okay? It's not zero. I mean, if you're at the target set point here, that's not going to typically be a flow rate of zero. Okay? All right. And hopefully, you can appreciate there's something here, an adjustable parameter. You have to choose it. I'm going to teach you how to choose it later. It's called the controller gain, KC. It tells you how sensitive the flow is to the set point, right? If this number is really large, then a small error generates a large change in W2. Otherwise, the opposite. Small value, small change. Um, for this, I'm going to argue this thing has to be positive. Okay? Because if the composition is less than the set point, then this thing is positive, and I want to multiply that by a positive number to get W2 to go up. All right, so that limits our search for a KC to be between 0 and, and plus infinity, which is still kind of large. And um, so I'm going to teach you exactly how to choose this. There's no way operator priori to know what this a good number here. It could be 0.1, it could be 10, it could be 23, it could be 10,500. It just depends. But I'll teach you how to do it. We're going to use a model to pick this thing. Okay. All right, so why does this make any sense? Well, hopefully you can appreciate that if x1 changes, then it'll get mixed up in here. Eventually, you'll see a change in x, and then you'll start to compensate for it. Okay. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't matter what causes x to change from the set point, you'll compensate for it. It could be x1 changes, could be w1 changes, could be anything. It doesn't matter. Okay. So you pay the price that this might be a little bit slow, right? You have to wait to see the effect before you can compensate for it. But it'll, it'll compensate for all possible problems. That's the power of it. And this is what we call feedback control. And this is the main focus of the course, is how to go about designing these feedback control systems. All right. Okay, so just to 
reiterate this quickly and um Uh, B4 controls the first thing I talk about. In this case, you measure the disturbance input, you measure the variable causing the problem, and, I, and then I, ideally you respond to the disturbance before it affects the process. So if you're lucky, in this case, right, you measure this disturbance, you calculate exactly the flow that will compensate for it, and then you wipe the piece. You see almost no effect of it, ideally. Okay? Um, this requires some model of how the disturbance affects the output. We'll talk more. And this is clearly not practical if you have a lot of disturbances. So the idea of feed forward control is if you're operating a plant and there's one disturbance that's particularly problematic, okay. a common thing, let's say you have a distillation column. Hopefully you know that distillation column, you don't pick the feed flow rate. The feed flow rate comes from whatever the downstream process that makes the material you're separating. You have to separate it. Okay, you don't get to choose the flow. So you might want to measure the flow and adjust based on that flow. Right, because you know the flow is going to vary. You know it's it's going to the column. You do appreciate. I hope that the column dynamics and behavior is affected a lot by the flow to the column. Okay, so that's something you might say. I'll try to do feed forward control on the flow because it's such a common disturbance. It's so important. Okay, but I'm not going to be able to do this for everything. Okay, and in particular, I'm not going to be able to do it for things that are um, expensive measurements like compositions. Okay, feedback control, instead of measuring the disturbance, you measure the effect of the disturbance through the controlled output. You don't respond to the problem until after it's affected the process, so this is just something you have to live with. As we'll talk about, it doesn't require a model, and this is, when people talk about control, this is what they mean, feedback control. Um, and it's possible to combine these two things. We'll talk about that um, two thirds of the course. You can do both feedback and feed forward. The idea here is, you do feed forward control with the one or two disturbances that are really the most problematic, and then you do feed back control to compensate for everything else. All right. So I assume you've seen something like this before. This is the old distillation column. You should have, if you didn't have your fill of this in um, what uh, separations, you'll get your fill of it in design. Because design is a lot of uh, distillation too. When you guys took separations, did you um, do any sim any simulations? Columns at all. Okay. You know what I mean? So, okay, so if you, right, you can write down the ideal distillation column, do like the cave field that you did that, right? Okay. Did you guys ever go to the computer and like solve a distillation model? Did you, did, what did you do to use that? What software did you use to do that calculation? So, Excel, okay. So, it's still like an ideal model. Be, right? okay. All right, that's fine. So I think in, in design, did Professor Mercer always talk about using Aspen today? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's good. Just one. All right. So here is a kind of a real distillation column. At least it looks like a column you might see in the industry. Obviously, you have feed coming into the column. <coughs> this is just a single feed. You might actually have multiple feeds, but in this case, you have one. Everyone knows how a column works. I hope it could be packed or it could be trayed, but we're going to apply heat to the bottom of the column, boil vapor up. In the, in the bottom of the column, there'll be an inventory of liquid. Okay. So these, one of the things I hope you get out of this course is that these inventories of material in the plant are really important to control the plant. Okay. Because if you don't have an inventory of liquid in the bottom of the column, there's no guarantee you can create vapor. Right? If you run out of liquid at the bottom of the column, you can't create vapor. If you run out of liquid at the top for reflux, you cannot create vapor going down the column. This will be a disaster for your column. So one of the things you'll see in, in columns is there's many places around the plant that just hold material, hold inventory, just to make the plant operable. Like typically at the beginning of a plant, you would have a big drum that holds material for the, for the column. Why? Because that way, a lot of material comes, you kind of store it in the drum temporarily. If not much material is coming, you have enough feed for the column by sucking material out of the drum. So inventories are very important. So you have an inventory in the bottom of the column um, to hold liquid. And then some of this liquid is going to be taken off of the bottom's product, and some of this is going to be taken back um, to create vapor going up the column. Right? I'm going to put it to an exchanger, vaporize it, send vapor up the column. We're going to take um, vapor off the top of the column. We're going to condense it. We're going to store it in a drum so we have inventory at the top of the column also. 
Some of this we're going to send back as reflux to the column, the rest we're going to take off of the distillate product. And then usually you're going to take the bottoms and, and distillate and one or both of them will go to another column to do further separation of the real plant. And in this case, we'll see we have one color. Okay. So you see some of the instrumentation here. If you see a valve, it means you can control the flow of that stream. Okay. If you see something that looks like this, that means this is a measurement. That's composition, that's level, that's pressure. Um, and then you see the different, uh, I assume you've seen pictures like that. You know that thing is heat exchanger, right? You've seen this picture like this before? I don't know if you have or not, to be honest. That depicts a heat exchanger. Mm -hmm. It depicts a drum, uh, valve, column, okay, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's say you wanted to control this column, okay? This, is, this begins to get to the complexity that you have in a real plant, okay? It's not the complexity, but at least it's approaching it. So, what would you like to control in this plant? Well, this is one of the main points in the class, is to try to figure out how to control things, right? So I'm just going to lead you through this now. The first thing, if someone said, so I've done this for a while, what would you like to control? The first thing I'd say, I want to control these inventories. I want to make sure there's always liquid there and always liquid there. Because if not, I'm going to be in serious trouble. Nothing else is going to work, okay? So, probably I want to control the level there, or the hold up. H means hold up, but level, hold up, volume, same thing. Control the amount of liquid in the drum and the amount of liquid in the bottom of the column. There's two things. Okay. Um, I probably want to control the compositions of these two product streams. Right? Because to know if you're doing good separation, you have to measure composition. Um, unless it's binary. You guys know that if you have a binary mixture, you can infer composition of the temperature. If you've learned that somewhere. But in history, you never have binary mixtures. <laughs> okay, you always have um, complex multi Okay, so I want to control these two compositions, and I probably want to control the pressure on the top of the column, because if I control the pressure at the top of the column, then I'll fix the pressure distribution down the column. Um, so here's a quiz. Let's see who wants to answer this. Where is the pressure highest in this column at the top or the bottom? Okay, let's talk to Professor Forbes. See, the reason reason you probably don't think about this is because if you don't do more detailed column modeling or analysis, then you don't think about pressure in the column. Right? Let's think about composition and nothing else. Okay, I'll answer it for you. Uh, the, the pressure, see, this is also the problem with the size, class this size. When I, used to, when I first taught you a class was like 30, and you get 10 people offering various opinions, often not correct, but when you get this size, no one wants to be the one person that says the top, and I go, Okay, so it's actually the bottom, so that's where you create the vapor. So you're going to have a pressure drop as you go up the column. The pressure will be highest at the bottom of the column. So if I fix the pressure at the top of the column, then um, that will fix the pressure distribution down the column. That will lead to more um, reliable operation of the column. So one thing you notice here is everything that I said I want to control, I have to be able to measure. I have to measure those two levels, I have to measure those two compositions, and I have to measure that pressure. Otherwise, I can't control it. Okay? All right. Here's another quiz. If I have five things I want to control, how many things do I have to manipulate to do it? It's a degree of freedom. I think in linear algebra. So if I have one thing I want to control, I have to, I have to manipulate at least one thing, right? So if I want to make five these five variables go anywhere I want, how many things do I have to change to do it? Let's see if again, it's this, this um, intimidation factor. Perhaps. i got to believe somebody knows the answer. All right. I gotta have at least five. Okay? Gotta have at least five things to manipulate. Um, so what could I manipulate? Well, how about I'm gonna uh, I would manipulate the duty, the amount of heat applied to the reboiler, the amount of heat applied or heat removed um, in the condenser up here, the flow of the distillate stream, the bottom stream, and the of the reflux stream. Okay, so five and five. Alright? So then, this is a mu obviously much more con complex control problem. Five things I want to control, I have five things I can manipulate. And so that's, we'll address this kind of complexity at the end of the course. So I think I already talked about all this. Oh, what are the primary disturbances here? Uh, the primary disturbances are typically